Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Double E's Talk Tech. My name is Mike Hoffman. I'm Daniel Bogdanoff, and we're back with Lee Barford. You maybe heard last time we talked about what is quantum computing, and we started to get into some of the applications of quantum computing about you know, storing superpositions of data in registers and you know, how that um, is applicable. At the very end, we started talking about how that's applicable to security. So I want to pick that up again. You talked about yep. the quantum computing is, you know, one of the applications is factoring large numbers. Can you yep. kind of pick up where you Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this part because I think you're, you're going to teach us how to crack RSA. Is yeah. that correct? <laughs> okay. Well, great. actually, uh, 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 <laughs> a famous guy by the name of Shore taught the world potentially how to, how, how to crack RSA. <laughs> But I, I want to back sure. up and say just a little bit about the history of quantum <laughs> computing. I think the, as far as I've been, as as far as I know, the first person to propose it was actually um, the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman in okay. uh, the mid '60s, and there was a small flurry <laughs> of interest, but it sort of died out. Um, however, in the about about 30 years later, in the mid '90s, um, um, this uh, doc, this uh, Dr. Shore, um, dis, uh, published uh, an, uh, uh, published a paper where he pointed out that uh, if you had a if you could build a quantum computer with with a, defined a certain defined a certain way and had a certain abstract um, discussion of what sorts of operations that quantum computer would have to be able to do. Um, which are now thought to be reasonable and is the primary model that people are working toward. If you could build a quantum hmm. computer with certain properties, then he presented um, an algorithm for factoring um, a number uh, that had that had um, uh, for, for finding one factor of of of, of okay. a num of a number of uh, um, no matter what it, no matter its what its length. And doing that in a reasonable number of these of these quantum um, machine code instructions that he out, that he outlined in the paper. Um, okay. Getting there, he also did a number of other interesting things, including creating one of the subroutines he needs in that algorithm is a quantum fast Fourier. It was a quantum fast Fourier transform. And so yeah. we got at least one thing that double E's are familiar with, <laughs> yeah. even in that very first paper. Now that paper, you know, um, it, it, much of the um, common um, security that we use every day is based not only in um, the RSA public key algorithm, but also in in a, in a, in a, in a method for key exchange called the Giff Diffie Hellman um, key exchange algorithm, and and that a, a version of that, for example. Is what's used to establish a secure connection in HTTPS. Oh, um, okay. And, and just so, a little um, background on on security, if you don't mind. So RSA, yeah. I think, stands for really secure algorithm. Is that correct? Uh, actually, really, it's Rivest really Shabir and Adel, <laughs> Adelman, which, and I may be pronouncing <laughs> those names um, slightly incorrectly. We may need to edit that, or sure. you may need to re-record that. <laughs> Um, we'll count it, yeah. But it, it's 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 the as far as I, as I recall, it's the remaining um, public key crypto system that hasn't been broken. In other words, the crypto system where you can you can publish um, uh, you ha every person who's participating in sending and receiving messages has two keys: a public one that, that they can that they can publish, and a private one that they hold. And if you want to send a message to, to Let's say Alice wants to send a message to Bob. Alice looks up Bob's public key, encrypts her message with Bob's public key, uh, sends it to Bob, and then only Bob, who has the public key, um, can um, the private key can private key has the public, private yeah. key can decrypt the message. Um, okay. Diffie Hellman solves a different problem, which is two people, Alice and Bob, are not known to each other, and yet they want to communicate. Right. So that's securely um so that is the um that's the method that uh can be used to establish an https connection right you want to establish okay. a secure connection to um a website that you've never communicated with before right um you can't make everybody in the world who uses the web um create an rsa 
private public key pair that sure. would be sort of onerous um so this algorithm called diffie hellman is used which also uses um the difficulty the presumed difficulty of factoring um, large, large numbers that have just the small that just have two prime factors um, okay. to um, to 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 send a, a private key between the two people who want to communicate. Um, so it's a good way to communicate very expensively, but briefly send a private okay. key that can be used in a, a much more computationally equipped, a, a computationally efficient crypto system. Um, for the main part of the commu- for the main part of the of the of the session, and you basically take two large prime numbers or two or more and multiply them together, and you end up with this number that you know someone assumes is a factor. It has only prime numbers as a factor, but can't actually, you know, the the processing power to figure out what those factors are is insane. Yeah, and, yeah. and there's no known algorithm. Like, it's not actually been decades, proved that factoring millennia. is hard, even with a classical computer. <laughs> Um, I think I but it's it assumed to be yeah. right because people have been working on on the better way to fact better ways of factoring numbers since since like Euclid. So twenty five hundred sure. years, nobody's found a really fast way, um, or in the computer science lingo, nobody's found a polynomial time algorithm um, for okay. fact for factoring large numbers. And so the presumption is, if all these smart people going back twenty five hundred years haven't found one, it's not likely that. <laughs> somebody's going to find one soon that makes sense um but sure sure's algorithm um would 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 be a a random but polynomial time or meaning you know computer science talk for it's fast enough algorithm for for factoring okay now to bring this back to quantum computing is the is the uh, necessarily necessarily a fear but is it believed that quantum computers will be able to make these kind of factoring calculations in a you know not thousands of years? Um, yes, if you could if you could build a quantum computer with enough quantum bits and that can operate um, uh, with a with a machine language cycle time um, that's reasonable, say microseconds okay. or even millisecond cycle times. Um, then it should be possible. Then it would be possible to to to, to do fact to factor, um, say thousand bit numbers, um, with um, with Shor's algorithm. The thing that interests me, though, is I talk to famous professors at famous at well known, well regarded, top ten in the world universities, and I get a huge disparity of opinion as to when. Hmm when a quantum computer of that size could be built. Okay. I've had I've had a couple tell me um, five years, ten years, no problem. I've had hmm. others tell me fifty years. Five zero wow. years. Um, and so there's a big disagreement even among the the really top experts in the field as to um, how long how long it's going to take. Um, and what but, what would a quantum computer look like? So um, I mean, not it, 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 it depends. Yeah. It's easier to describe architecturally than than the physics. Okay. Um, the algorithms, um, although people talk about quantum computers as as a separate thing from a, a classical computer mm-hmm. containing you know um, current modern digital hardware, it isn't. Um, all of okay. the approaches of which I'm aware. The quantum computer is really kind of a coprocessor that has to exist with hmm. um, with with current forms of of digital electronics. And if you look at algorithms like Shor's Shor's algorithm, um, you'll see a mixture of operations that are just traditional computer uh, operations. You know, if statements, store count um, for for loops that are um, okay done in you know, with a with a with a current kind of single core computer or an FPGA or some other dig- form of you know or an ASIC, mm-hmm. um, just conventional digital electronics, and then other things that have to be done in the quantum world with these quantum bits and quantum 
I'll call them assembly language operations or quantum gates. Um, the field calls them quantum gates. I don't like the term because they happen in time, not in space. Um, so I, being a computer scientist, I think of them as assembly yeah. language operations, and they are fundamentally okay. different things um, for setting up the kind of superpositions or Schrodinger cat states in the registers that we talked about earlier. That takes a completely okay. different kind of assembly language operation than what we're used to. Um, okay. so, so quantum what, computer what kind of quantum it, computers well, I'm sorry I was going to ask what, what kind of quantum computers have been built so far today are they just theoretical still or have some been built yet no they've some some have been built but with only a few um, with only a, um, a few quantum bits um, I believe the current claims are 21 21 quantum bits um, we don't know what kind of um, it's not clear what's how how, uh, how noisy those are. Um, there are various kinds of, of errors um, that, that that can creep in. We don't know what their lifetimes are. Um, whether whether you can maintain the um, say a, a superposition of states for microseconds or or or, se or, or, or seconds is is, so is is not so clear in the press report. There's a bit um, of ahead. a setup and hold time. There's a bit of a setup and hold time challenge, is, is what you're saying there. Right? Well, it, it's it's not just that. It's just once you um, once you create once um, um, now it's time to get into some physics. If you sure. remember, um, sure. If we if we continue this analogy of Schrodinger's cat as a, as a mm -hmm. admittedly oversimplified model for our, for a quantum bit. Um, right. Now, in in the simple sort of high school version of, of Schrodinger's cat, right? It's it's isolated in the box and it's mm -hmm. it's both alive and dead until you do the measurement, until you open the box or otherwise um, um, measure whether the cat is alive or dead. And then it becomes one or the other definitively once it's measured. When we, um, in reality, um, if you have a, 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 a little, a, if you have a piece of physics that you've managed to put into one of these um, superimposed quantum states, mm -hmm. there's a, a um, what it, you have to, any disturbance, any disturbance of it. Um, in other words, every impact of a photon of a wrong energy, of an unfortunate energy will disturb yeah. the system and cause it to go into um, one of those states or even possibly some other uh, state that was not intended in the design. Hmm. Um, and so um, these the physical manifestations of these quantum bits have to be highly isolated from the rest of the universe. Okay. And that's done by either putting them in extreme vacuums or um, in extreme cold. Okay. Meaning subs way under a degree Kelvin cold, wow. um, which okay. is why That's it's super cold. Um, <laughs> there are other there are other approaches that are solid that are that are solid state. They have other different problems. Okay. Um, and it's not clear how far along those are. The the the, the famous um the the company the companies and research groups that are making big claims about we have nineteen quantum bits we have twenty one quantum bits um those are th those um to my recollection those are not um the solid state ones. um but either okay. way you have to have a high degree of a high degree of um a, a ver this very high degree of isolation um that isolation can't be perfect and sure. so you have to um there is a limited lifetime that you could for the computation before okay. you have the ex before the probability gets too high of an external disturbance um, ruining the calculation. So, forgive me if I'm backtracking here. And no, maybe, no, no, please. Yeah. You know, why does it matter when the the superposition bits collapse? Like, it, if we're going to collapse it at some it, point, 
you know. Ah. Does that make sense? Well, be, well simply because if it collapses at the wrong time, you'll get a wrong answer. Oh. Okay. Um, and um, uh, something like Shure's algorithm, um, mm-hmm. it's easy to multiply. And I think this is how I got to talking about Shure's algorithm in the first place. Shure's algorithm, if you multiply, it's easy to check whether or not you got a right answer. If you get a factor, if you get a number that is claimed to be a factor of your input, you simply div- mm-hmm. do long division. Sure. That makes and you sense. either uh, right, and and, and, you, and either yeah. you get a remainder of zero mm-hmm. and on a classical computer, and that's fast and that's reliable, highly reliable, and you either get zero as the remainder or you don't. So okay. even though the compute the the underlying quantum computation only has to be reliable enough that you're likely enough to get the right answer that you can do a loop of of checking to see whether you got the right answer and that will convert okay. quickly enough. Oh, that will you'll find it you'll find a right answer quickly enough. And so the okay. algorithm is resilient to errors in the qubits, this sort of premature collapsing, um, and um, um, even can be probabilistic in the sense that it was only supposed to get a certain probability of getting the right answer. <laughs> okay. But if the probabilities of getting the right answer are high enough, then it doesn't matter that you that you you can afford to get the wrong answer some number of times because in the end, in the end, you you'll get you you can verifiably get the correct answer. And if the probabilities are high enough, then you'll get it much faster still than a classic computer. Okay. Question for you, uh, yep. without making my head explode, because this stuff is definitely complicated. But so we're talking about the the bits. They have certain probabilities of states. So I, I'm assuming those probabilities can be variable, right? It's not yeah. like 50-50. No. So how, how does the computer itself, or maybe uh, I'm assuming there's some sort of physical thing that's going on, how are the, the, the probabilities of those bits actually changed? Like, what, how do you, what, what are you doing? Are you yep. injecting energy into the bit, or is it something mm-hmm. to do with the spin of the electrons, or what? It depends on, it, de- it depends on the physical system, and um, the, the, um, this is where my knowledge starts to really run out. Um, however, in the approaches um, where Keysight is making a biggest contribution, you do you are injecting energy into the system, and you're doing that as um, a very small number of photons at a typically at a microwave energy, with a careful controlled as a pulse, with a carefully controlled timing and phase okay and so sort hmm. of we're, we're at the moment where key site ends is a as at the generation and um and measurement of of those pulses and so that sort of explains why key site right we're good at microwaves um we're good hmm. at, at, at generating them and and measuring them um at 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 metro with metrological levels of precision um, and then I mentioned that you have to do though you have to do that at very a carefully controlled time, um, preferably sub sub nanosecond um, time accuracy. And if you're going to have multiple quantum bits, you have to have that sort of level of time synchronization across across all the bits. Because if I'm going to manipulate all the bits, right, to, in order to have a multi-bit data, then um, I need to be able to do those excite. I need to be able to generate those pulses across all the channels for for all all the bits with that sort of um, those sorts of levels of timing accuracy. And that's something in particular that Keysight um, brings to the party that the um, that the physicists who do understand the the physics beyond that level in the in in the in the, um, the little tiny highly isolated thing. Um, which is going to be the quantum, uh, which is going to be a quantum bit. That's that's what they gain from us, and that that's that's uh, that's okay. what we're helping. Now, okay. what is? I'm gonna, we're actually out of time again. Uh, what, what, uh, one more question. Go ahead. Yep. What is the quantum bit? Is it like an atom, or is um, it, it a can, group the, of atoms, or two common kind? Two common kinds is um, 
are are ions um, trapped at um, trapped in a vacuum with um, um, with laser trapping. So you have interacting um, okay. laser beams, and the um, these ions can't yeah. <laughs> can't move because they're held in place by uh, st- by standing waves of of the, of the laser okay. beams. And so that's their isolation. That's their low temperature, right? The the, the vacuum vessel can be at, at room temperature, but the ions have very low temperature because they can't move. Sure. Um, okay. Another another kind are done with uh, done with Joseph's junctions. Um, so they're mm-hmm. um, 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 non linear circuit elements um, that operate at extremely low temperatures and. What's built is uh, basically tank circuits. Um, so you have a, a coil capacitor and a and this Joseph's junction, and those together produce um, produce um, uh, o- oscillations um, at microwave frequencies at different modes. Um, how, how, however, at sufficiently under the right physical conditions, those can be designed. To behave um, just like um, uh, just like an ideal um, two-state quantum, an abstract two-state quantum system with um, two states that hmm. you just designate can designate zero and one, and behave um, um, as an ideal as an idealized um, um, uh, idealized uh, bit that you can manipulate uh, the pro- manipulate right. the probabilities of that bit being okay. zero, zero and one, actually what the quantum people <laughs> call amplitude. So wow. there's another level of complication where there's complex math. I'm going to try to avoid that, and we'll just call them probabilities. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> On the comments below, the real physicists will, can explain why that's completely wrong, <laughs> and you actually need what they call complex amplitudes. Um, huh. But for the current purposes, let's just think of it as the probabilities of being zero at zero and one. So the um, okay, um, it, it it's um, so 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 to, to try to summarize out all that, the, the physicists have an ideal yeah. oscillate non uh, non um, non linear oscillator that has the right mathematical properties that corresponds well to the assembly language instructions that you want to write that manipulates these probabilities across single or multiple quantum bits. And that turns it, that, that nonlinear oscillator, you can build an, an extreme cold with, with one of these Joseph's junction tanks. Okay. And I think uh, Keysight had, I've been meaning to write a blog post on the Joseph's junction because it's a fascinating device. Um, that's where we get our, you know, if you think back to one of our early podcasts, we talked about different standards. The Joseph's Junction is the root of the standard for what voltage is. Mm. Um, and I think Keysight had the first commercially available Joseph's Junction up in our metrology lab in Loveland. Um, we're out of time for today. Again, the time has just been flying by. We're going to definitely have, Lee, we're definitely going to have you back on for another okay. episode. Maybe we'll talk about parallel computing or, or some other topic we'll we'll talk offline definitely now. i'm not sure if i feel smarter or dumber after these conversations it's yeah. it's a it's a well, it's, I can it's have some, some, weird some crazy stuff <laughs> well and, and the, th- the thing is every every time i go for a visit of folks who are really doing this work um i, I come away feeling a lot dumber too um you know it, it's glad i'm not alone there um you know, and and I'm I, I I I consider myself very much a beginner <laughs> in this, despite um, you know, this, despite what I've um, that's what they've all said. What I've, so far, what I've but... said, I, I, I you know, I I, I, I am very I, I I'm I'm very much a beginner in this myself. Jeez, what does that make us? So we um, so we like to have a session uh, a section at the end of our podcast that we recently added. And it's um, we like to ask our guests what we call a stupid question. Okay. Uh, so I have one for you. I'm going to steal Mike's thunder, and then we're going to yeah, yeah. so you don't even get one. Sorry, done. I'll do the, um, do it next time. If you had Schrodinger's cat in a box, would you look or not? <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the answer is, if I really had Schrodinger's cat in a box, I would go ahead and look because the cat's at room temperature, 
And so, in <laughs> fact, the experiment is already over be- be- before I look. Um, <laughs> so freeze the cat first, basically. Okay. Yeah, because the cat, the, the, the cat, the, cat the, the cat's wave function really collapsed way back when okay. some some random um, infrared photons floating around the box just happened to happened to do the wrong happened to um, happened to do the <laughs> wrong that thing. Happens. And and it's so it's already it alive like, or dead. And yeah. the fact that I look in or not doesn't matter. <clears throat> I was looking at this as a glass half full, glass half empty kind of question, but that was a whole new level. Of, uh, <laughs> so, thank you, Lee, so much for um, coming on. Again, it's been a, a pleasure yeah, having welcome. you. We'll have you back for another one. Make sure you subscribe to the Keyside Oscilloscopes YouTube channel. Check us out on your favorite podcast engine, uh, Doubly's Talk Tech, and we will see you next time. Cheers.